just an announcement uh, before we begin. If you haven't heard from your team members, uh, send them an email. We ask that the grad students contact all of the teams, but I think there are a few teams that may not have heard from their team leaders. So if you haven't heard anything from the other people on your team, please send them an email. Uh, sometimes there are spam filters that uh, block emails. We all know, know about that. And since you're corresponding with students who are off campus, sometimes they can't reach you or you can't reach them. So uh, please do correspond with them. Uh, the deadlines for the project proposal are coming up. So you want to look at that. And in order to submit your project proposal, you need to be in touch with your team members. So if you have any problems and you don't get in touch with your team members, let's say by Monday, uh, write us an email and let us know and then we'll try and contact them and see if we have any luck doing it. Okay, good. So this evening, would like to get started and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Cole, who is back again this year. Uh, he spoke to the class last year. Uh, fascinating work that he's doing on the internet, speaking of spam filters. Uh, you'll be hearing more about the internet this evening. Uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Cole and uh, some of his work, and then we'll get right to the presentation. Jeffrey Cole's been at the forefront of media and communication technology issues in both the United States and internationally for the past 25 years. He is an expert in the field of technology and emerging media and serves as an advisor to governments and leading companies around the world as they craft digital strategies. In July 2004, Dr. Cole joined the USC Annenberg School for Communication as director of the newly formed Center for the Digital Future as a research professor. The center is a research and policy institute committed to work that has a real and beneficial effect on people's lives while seeking to maximize the positive potential of the mass media and our rapidly evolving communication technologies. At UCLA and now at USC Annenberg, Cole founded and directs the World Internet Project, a long-term longitudinal look at the effects of computer and internet technology, which is conducted in over 25 countries. And he's going to be sharing some of the research uh, from all of these different centers with you this evening. And I think this is really uh, an amazing project in that it combines not only the work from the US context, but from around the world. Uh, Dr. Cole regularly presents trends and insights of the project to the White House, FCC, Congress, Department of Defense, and to governments around the world. Uh, in fact, he told me last week he was in Berlin presenting some results to the German government. On the corporate side, Dr. Cole advises Microsoft, Sony, Time Warner, Accenture, Coca-Cola, AT&T, AR, AARP, and others in their traditional and digital media strategies. And he can perhaps also tell you a little bit about uh, that side of his work. Uh, last but not least, and you can also look at the full biography on the website, uh, Dr. Cole was a member of the Executive Committee of the Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences from 1997 to 2001 and was the founding governor of the ATAS Interactive Media Peer Group. So would you please welcome Dr. Jeffrey Cole. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. It's really great to be back here in Ames. I have not taught in about 10 years, so I don't think doctor is in order. Only my mother still calls me doctor. So just Jeff is fine. Incidentally, I don't know if I'm a shaker, but I'm definitely a mover. So I hope I don't make anyone trying to run a camera dizzy. And so let's get started. We have till what? A little before 11 o'clock. So uh, uh, 
Anyway, let me give you a sense of the work I'm doing so that you can really understand where the trends and insights I want to talk about uh, the rest of the time we do have tonight, where they come from. And why don't we, uh, we've left some time for questions, so let's leave big, broad questions till the end. But if you have questions, there are things you want to disagree with or you want a little more information right as I'm talking about them, please raise your hand. You don't, don't wait on those and let's have as much of a dialogue as we possibly can and then we can deal with big themes if there are any big theme questions at the end. But let me start with the fact that I'm a television guy. I had spent most of my life studying and then working in and around television with broadcast networks and I was always taught that television was the most powerful medium ever invented and I think it was. But in the work I was doing in television I was taught that we blew it. We lost a great opportunity. And what I mean by that is television, if you think about it, is the only medium we knew ahead of time was going to be a mass medium. There was no question in the 1940s that radio listeners were going to embrace radio with pictures. So since we knew that television was going to be successful before the first signal was broadcast, what I was taught that we should have done and didn't do is we should have tracked people before they had television and then gone back to them year after year as they acquired and used television to see how it changed their lives. And if we had done that, we would have learned some pretty compelling information, such as where did the time for television come from? When Americans were watching three hours of television a day, and we were asked, where did those three hours come from? What were we doing less of? We didn't know. We just grabbed that time out of the air. We could have learned if the time for television came from talking as a family, reading books or newspapers, or going to the movies, or from some other place, or all of those places. And how did television change our buying behavior? Did it make us more likely to buy the goods and services we saw advertised? I think we know it did. How did it change our connection to the civic process? Did it make us more engaged in politics and likely to participate and vote? Or did it make us more cynical and detached? And how did it change our desire to travel, where we wanted to travel to, and a hundred other things we could have learned from television and didn't? And I had become convinced in the late 1990s that the impact of the internet and wireless was going to be far more significant than television. The thing that convinced me of that, working with the American broadcast networks, was seeing data beginning in 1998 that showed for the first time in the history of television, kids under the age of 14 were starting to watch less television and the explanation was singularly computers and the internet. The first time kids had ever been drawn away from television, the most powerful medium ever invented. So that spoke to me in terms that I could understand that the internet and wireless were significant if it could draw kids away from television. And television's mostly about leisure and entertainment. The internet, as you know better than just about any people in the country as college students, the internet affects on a minute-by-minute -minute basis how you communicate, how you work, how you play, and perhaps its most important long-term impact will be on how we learn. So believing that the impact of the internet was going to be more significant than television and that we had lost this great opportunity with television Seven years ago, we launched this project, this study of the internet that we thought should have been conducted of television. And I'll take just a moment, you're not college professors in statistics, so we don't have to spend the next hour and a half on methodology, although if, so, if someone's interested in methodology, I'll answer more questions than you could ever want to answer, than you ever would want answered. But I'll tell you that we started in the United States with a representative sample of the American population. And we've gone back to the same people seven years in a row, and we have watched as non-users of the internet move to dial-up. As dial-up users migrated to broadband. And we saw about five years ago, and I think I talked about this last year in some detail, the ways in which broadband changes everything. 
not for the reasons most people acquired broadband, the speed, but it was the always on, the direct connection that really changes the relationship to the internet. We watch as about two and a half percent of people drop off the web each year, and we want to know who are these people who leave, and more importantly, do they return, and if so, when, and what brings them back? And then seven years in, we want to know who the never users are. Who are the people who have never been online? Who are they demographically? Why are they not online? And a policy question we're just beginning to address with the government, should we care that they're not online? Should we be twisting their arms, persuading and cajoling them to go on the internet? Or should we let them live their lives peaceably and happily away from the web? If you live in Mexico, and you make more than 300,000 pesos a year, or 30,000 US dollars, you must file your taxes online. One of the ways the Mexican government's trying to increase penetration from 18%. Should we be doing that? Because we crossed a very important threshold last year where the internet's concerned in the United States. In the US, Britain, Germany, Italy, Sweden, Finland, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea, all developed countries. In those countries, beginning last year, we could say, and I will say this very carefully, we can say that just about everybody who wants to be online is online. The digital divide, in its broadest terms, access to the internet has largely disappeared. The qualifier, not everybody in America who wants a PC sitting on their desk has one. Not everybody who wants broadband has it. But just about everybody who wants to access the internet from some location, work, school, home, from some place can. Cost has disappeared as a barrier to access. Cost is still a divide on broadband and having your own PC, but it doesn't keep people offline. The two reasons people in America are still not online, and they're mostly age-based reasons, are fear. Fear the technology is too difficult to use or attached to a computer, which I could never understand, or that a misstep on the internet means I will blow up my home, my city, and my country. And the other reason people are not online is lack of perceived need. Some people think, I live my life just fine. There couldn't possibly be anything on the web that would change my life in any meaningful way. But the divide from the broadest sense has gone away. We started our work in the United States. As Mark mentioned, we're now in about 27 countries. We're in all the obvious places you would expect in Western Europe and Asia, but we're also in some pretty interesting places, such as Iran, Bolivia, uh, Nigeria, where we have some really interesting comparisons between developing and developed countries. And interesting questions we can answer, such as, India is now at 4% penetration. That happens to be a pretty high number of people in raw terms. When India gets to 20%, will it be at the same place as the United States was when we were at 20%? Or will they leapfrog because they will have learned things from us that as we've moved past 20%? Those are some of the interesting questions we'll look at. Anyway, this is the work I do. I don't want to spend much more time on outlining this. What I really want to share with you is some of the results, some of the things we're finding. And I don't think anybody is here from last year other than Jim or Mark, and I would not use that as an excuse to repeat stuff, which I would find boring to do anyway. But I do want to do an update on this first section I'm looking at, and then everything, and give you new data, and then everything else, if anybody does happen to be here or through distance learning, listening, is completely different. So let me start with some of the things we've learned from six years in the field. And first, the ways in which the internet has shifted power, real and imagined power, from corporations and governments into the hands of individuals. And start with user-generated content. And before you look at the data, with no hyperbole whatsoever, we can argue that the internet's reversing 550 years of media trends that began with Gutenberg and his Bible in Germany in the 15th century. Up until the internet, all mass communication has been from the few to the many. 
and the many, us, have had very few and poor ways of communicating back. A letter to the editor, a, a call to a television station, both of which are usually ignored. What we're seeing through the internet is today, internet users, but especially teenagers, are saying, I don't just want to receive information. I want to share. I want to generate. Now, they're not vain enough to say, I only want to generate. Of course, you still want to receive high quality news, good music, interesting video. But it's not just about receiving passively. It's generating as well. If you ask internet users, almost every slide I'm going to show, with one exception, is, is a combination of US, German, British, Swedish, and Japanese data. So it is biased, the stuff I'm showing tonight, towards developed countries. But if you ask people in those five countries, do you have your own blog? Do you display photos or video on the web? Or do you have your own website? You can see a little bit of growth in almost every age group except the 55s and above. But if you look at the under 18s, you see phenomenal growth, a more than tripling in less than three years. If you talk to teenagers in America today, <coughs> one of the things you learn is it's not 15 minutes of fame they care about at all. It's 15 megabytes of fame. Because 15 minutes is gone in 15 minutes. And who cares about being famous for 15 minutes when 15 megabytes can make you famous forever? And actually, it's really 15 gigabytes. I just happen to like the alliteration of minutes and megabytes. A word or two in this about blogging, a form of user-generated content. We think blogging is hugely, how many of you have your own blogs, incidentally? We, fairly small, maybe 15, 20%. We think blogging is hugely significant as a phenomenon. The fact that anyone can take their random thoughts and put them on the web for any or all to read is absolutely phenomenal. That being said, our work shows that almost nobody reads blogs. The audience, that's not making fun of blogs. And, and bear me out for a minute. I, well, that's, the audience for blogs is tiny. The way that most of us find out what's in a blog is because among the tiny audience for a blog are mainstream, broad, mainstream print and broadcast reporters. And it's when they see something interesting in a blog that they put it in the newspaper or on the television station and that most of us find out about it. Or most of us find out from email links by somebody saying, you got to see this. But very few of us read blogs directly. There are, if you believe Technorati, there are 70 million bloggers out there. That means, and this is quite remarkable, that there are 140 million eyeballs, assuming there are no one-eyed bloggers, who are seeing things that government can't see or doesn't want you to see, who are in places the media can't be. And that is absolutely remarkable that there are all these other eyes out there. And bloggers have contributed to very significant stories. In the 2004 presidential election, it was bloggers who brought down Dan Rather. It was bloggers who were part of the uh, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. It's bloggers and YouTube, which were part of Makaka and Senator George Allen. Uh, bloggers have already been very significant. But most bloggers have achieved the anonymity they so richly deserve. Because even though it's remarkable that anyone and everyone can create their own blogs and share their random thoughts, the truth is most of our random thoughts, my own included, aren't very interesting. Just as it's remarkable with public access cable that we've had for the last 30 years that anyone can start their own television station. But most of us don't have great television ideas. But blogging does play a very important role. Something we saw, uh, interestingly, about two years ago and seems to amplify is the fact that we're going to the internet without a destination. Let me explain why I think this is important. Television. Within television, we used to have what we call content viewers and medium viewers. Most people started watching television as a content viewer. A content viewer of television is someone who says, 
I want to watch a show Thursday night at 8 o'clock. So you turn on the television set a minute or two or three before 8. You watch your show till 8.30 or 9. And then you turn the television set off and you go watch, do, you go do something else. That's content viewing. That's watching a particular program. But as we were growing up, many of us found out that we liked television. We shifted to what we call medium viewers. We liked television so much that we usually turned it on when we entered the house and left it on. And when we had nothing else to do or we were tired, we sat down in front of the television set, not even knowing what was on. And we would change the channel until we found the show we most wanted to watch, or as Paul Klein at NBC used to say, the show that we least objected to. We weren't watching programs anymore. We were watching television, and we picked the best of what was on. Ironically, television's returning to content viewing through PVRs and TiVos, because now we stockpile the shows we really care about, and when we want to watch television, we don't have to find the show we least object to. We've stockpiled on a hard drive the things we really care about. The Internet's done the same thing. And with the Internet, we started as content users of the Internet. We'd write down on the back of an envelope all the things we wanted to do when we logged on to the internet through dial-up. We'd do those things, and then we'd log off and go do something else, such as watch television. Now we've become medium users of the internet. Now when we have an extra half hour or we're bored, we sit down in front of the PC and go online, not even sure necessarily where we're going to go which is why it became important for us to know what people's home pages were. Where did they start the search? But we found, if you look at the data, we found that about 72% of Internet users sometimes or often go to the Internet as a pastime without even knowing precisely where they're going or what they're going to do. And their journey, which can last from a few minutes to hours, depends on the links, the email, all of the different things they get. But frequently, you ask those people when they get up, did they know what they were going to do? And the answer is no. And the one slide that's American, and I did talk about this last year, so I will t only because you're in the middle of this incredible primary in Iowa caucuses, just talk about this very, very briefly. Um, we think that uh, the print and broadcast media have forever changed politics. You can't run for office without factoring in newspapers and magazines and television and radio. It's the reason candidates have to raise so much money. Interesting, incidentally, I don't know if you know, I'm in California, which is traditionally a democratic state, uh, although we have a Republican governor, a rather unusual Republican governor. I have not seen a political ad this entire year. The first political ad I saw was last night here in Iowa, because this is where all the money is being spent. They're not spending it in Alabama, which almost under any circumstances is going to go Republican. They're not spending it in California. When the primary gets closer, the Democrats will spend it. But I have, no one has cared about California because it will go one direction pretty safely in a long time. I saw my first Obama ad last night. It was sort of fun to see. But print and broadcast forever change politics. Print and broadcast have made their audiences feel better informed. But they've never made their audiences feel more powerful. And the Internet didn't either until after the 2004 presidential election. If you look in 2005, we go into the field in early in the year. So we saw after the 2004 presidential election a spiking, a significant spiking in the number of Americans on the web who felt that through the Internet they were gaining political power. Not knowledge, but power, ability to affect the outcome. And if you look, you can see it went up to 40% of people on the web who actually thought they were gaining political power. I think this is hugely significant. I believe that in a country where I think most people think the Republican Party is imploding and the Democratic Party offers nothing, if anything, in the way of alternatives or leadership, and I think that's a pretty bipartisan jab. 
I think we may see in this country for the first time in 150 years the rise of a successful third party. The last third party that succeeded in this country was the Republican Party in the 1850s. I think we may see it again. Which party would go under, we can debate right now. It would look like it was the Republican Party five years ago. It conclusively would have looked like it was the Democratic Party. That may shift. But I think we're going to see significant changes in our political system that are going to come because of the Internet. The last thing I want to talk about in this update section is online communities. I came here, it was about 18 months ago, and I was talking about MySpace. And I had been talking about MySpace for about a year before that. And I was saying that I didn't think that Rupert Murdoch and News Corporation would be able to hang on to the teenage users of MySpace. And News Corp and uh, MySpace guys themselves really didn't like me saying that. And they criticized me. And that's okay, that's fun sometimes when you get into one of those little wars. They criticized me, not by saying he's wrong, we are hanging on to our teenage users. They criticized me by saying, look how much money we've made. And they're absolutely right. They paid $580 million for MySpace. Looks like the steal of the new century compared to the $626 million that NBC spent on iVillage, a deal I can't even begin to understand. I have friends who work at NBC who have sat me down and explained the deal, and I'm not just being silly, I actually understand it less after they explain it to me. And it looks like a real steal compared to the $1.65 billion that Google spent on YouTube. MySpace and News Corporation and Fox brilliant, have already signed a $900 million ad share deal with Google. They brilliantly marketed X-Men 3 last year and Borat last fall. And now what may turn out to be one of the greatest deals of all time, there's rumors, only rumors, that News Corporation may trade MySpace for a 25% share of Yahoo which in today's dollars would make MySpace worth about $9 billion. All of this is right. If Fox and News Corp and Rupert Murdoch had come to me and said, should we buy MySpace? Amazingly, they didn't. But had they, in an instant, I would have said yes. All that being said, I've been saying for about two years now, they're not going to be able to hang on to their teenage users, and we've been proved right. We're not proved right in everything I say. We've made some predictions I won't bother talking about tonight. But we've been right in this. We have seen early on that to members, to teenagers in online communities, there's no criticism, this is just the way people are, to teenagers, online communities are like nightclubs. And when the nightclub becomes too popular or the uncool kids start showing up at the nightclub, they're out of there. Because the cost of going from one club to another, or from my space to your space, is nil. We think it's a fundamental quality of being a teen, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, you want to discover the new club or the new community and be the pioneer on the frontier and turn your friends on to it. The first place we saw this was with the demise of Friendster. I don't know, have any of you, were any of you ever members of Friendster? Friendster was as hot as could be two and a half years ago, and now there doesn't seem to be a single person in the room who's a member. This is a normal phase. Uh, the adult users of MySpace, we found, were very sticky. They stay in the community. They don't migrate and constantly move. And what's interesting, this has happened with MySpace, which has now lost, I would argue, a lot of its momentum to Facebook. And uh, for the first time, MySpace is boasting about its adult users. None of this is a criticism of MySpace. It's actually a product of how successful MySpace was that it's moved on to Facebook. One of the predictions I made that was wrong, it may ultimately be right, I thought Facebook, how many of you are members of Facebook? I thought Facebook had made a very serious mistake a year, a little over a year ago, by opening Facebook first to high school students and now to anyone. 
I thought they had alienated their core audience, you, people who had to have an EDU address. And for a little while, it looked like I was right, but they opened it for a very simple reason. They wanted to show growth so that they could sell it. And they actually came close to a billion dollar deal last year with Yahoo. Again, Yahoo needs to do something because it's, it's struggling. And uh, they didn't sell it. And it now looks like they're either going to sell it soon or put it up for an IPO. And Facebook, as you know, is bigger than it has ever been. Although I think the same phenomenon will occur with Facebook as well. And whether these cycles of going in and out are a year, I don't think it's going to be a year, probably more like two to three years. And, but we shall see. The most interesting piece of data out of our 2007 report shows that to members of online communities, 43%, or almost half, say that their online communities are as important to them as their offline communities. That the worlds they formed online are as important, half, almost half, as the worlds they formed offline. That is pretty compelling. If you ask members of communities, how important are these communities to you? In 2005, 96% said they're at least somewhat important. Only 3.6% said, eh, not really. Amazingly, that 96% climbed to 97.5%. So that only 2.5% say they're not very important. And two-thirds say they're very or extremely important. And if you ask members of these communities, what do you do when you're logged into an online community? Number one activity is posting messages, generating content. And if you ask people, how often do you interact with the other members of your community? Only 7% are voyeurs passively lurking in the background. Actually, that sounds so sexual. <laughs> Only 7% are passively watching. Maybe they're voyeurs as well. But the other 93% are participating. And if you also, if you ask people, I don't think I brought that slide. No, so if you ask people, do you feel that you've contributed to the building of your community? Only 20% say no. I'm not really, it's not me. The other 80% say yes. And of that 80%, two thirds feel that they've contributed a lot. There's ownership, there's participation, very significant. Move into some new areas, internet and media. Internet's no longer a threat to television, which implies that at one point we thought the internet was a threat to television, and we did. If you ask internet users around the world, are you, since connecting to the internet, are you watching more, excuse me, are, how much television are you watching? If you look in every country in the world we are in, internet users in blue watch less television than non-users in yellow. If you ask them, are you watching more or less, the numbers are quite remarkable. In, uh, if you look at Spain, 41% of Spaniards say, since connecting to the internet, I'm watching less television. Less than 1% say they're watching more. Numbers roughly comparable in the US, where 38% of us say we're watching less, and 2.3% of us say we're watching more. But it turns out, one of the great advantages of a longitudinal study, it turns out that saying the internet is a threat to television was not enough. Incidentally, the internet threatening television was no great surprise. Americans, if you think about it, are at home, awake time, has always been dominated by television. Many of us turn the television set on the minute we enter the home. Many of us leave it on until we go to sleep. Some of us leave it on to go to sleep by. And some of us even leave it on when we're not at home so that people think we are at home. So if we're going to carve out time at home to do anything, read a book, take a nap, to do anything, that time almost had to come from television. But it turns out, as I mentioned, we didn't get the story entirely correct. That's the advantage of a longitudinal study. It turns out that it wasn't the internet that was a threat to television. It was dial-up that was a threat to television. 
The average dial-up user is online two to three times a day, 20 to 30 minutes at a time. And when we were using dial-up at home, many of us, depending on the configuration of our home, would, would move the PC or the internet access device into the backstage of the home, into a back office, a back bedroom, someplace away from the center of the home, if we had a big enough home to accommodate that. And when we wanted to go online for these buckets of 20 or 30 minutes at a time, and we went on for 20 or 30 minutes because we had to dial up and we viewed dialing up as a big deal, when we went online and we went into the back room, that was generally time spent away from our family, although they could follow us into the back room, and it was generally time spent not watching television, although many of us could have had televisions where the PC was and be multitasking at the same time. But broadband, we very quickly found, was very different. The average broadband user at home is on 20 to 40 times a day for two or three minutes at a time. Now, when you're writing a paper, you may be on broadband for four hours at a time. But most broadband users are on, not in these buckets of two or three minutes, two or three times a day, but 40, 50 times for two or three minutes. And what we found, first of all, was with broadband, because you didn't have to dial up and you were on so many times a day, people didn't want the internet in the backstage of the home. They wanted it in the center stage of the home. They wanted it where they were. They wanted it in the most humanly networked room in the house, which would be the kitchen. If you've ever thought about it, the kitchen is the first room most people stop in when they enter the home. It's where most women leave their purses. It's where most families have their answering machines. It's where if the fam one family member is leaving a note for another, they almost always leave it in the kitchen. And the kitchen is also where we have the family art gallery, also known as the refrigerator. Uh, so people were moving, with broadband, they were moving the internet access to the kitchen, to the family room, to the den, where they were in the center stage, because since they were going on so many times, they wanted it right where they were. So now, we were, we were, the internet was on broadband was not interfering with family conversations. It was occurring before, after, or during the natural rhythm and pauses of family conversations. And it wasn't displacing television programming viewing. The internet, we were going on before the program started, after it ended, or something even more threatening for broadcast networks during the commercial. It became one more thing we did during the commercial. Now I would argue, talk about television advertising for a moment, I would argue television advertising has been challenged for 30 years and that the internet is an almost minute part of that, played almost no role. I would start by saying the first thing that threatened television advertising in the 1970s was the rise of the remote control. I'm old enough to remember when remote controls were options on television sets. Uh, now you can't buy a television set without a remote control. And a matter, as a matter of fact, if any of you own those beautiful new flat panel sets, they're almost impossible to control at the set. Manufacturers don't want your grubby little fingers all over their beautiful set. You almost have, some of them, I'm serious. I've had to study them for five minutes before I can figure out how to change a channel. They don't want you going anywhere near it, except with the remote. The remote control gave you a way to go somewhere else during the commercial. That was the first threat. The second threat in the uh, 70s and then into the 80s was the rise of dozens and now hundreds of cable and satellite channels which gave you all these new somewhere else's to go to with the remote control. And uh, now, during a commercial, many of us begin a journey from which we may never return to the place from we, where we started, or if we do, it may be after the commercial is over, the program's already started, but many times we just find something better during the commercial and never go back. The third thing, 
interfering with the rise with television advertising also occurred in the 70s and 80s the rise of the VCR which gave us the ability to scan through commercials but we found that only 20% of people who own VCRs ever recorded on them 80% use them exclusively for playback so VCRs only had the potential to let you scan through commercials but that's a potential now being fully delivered upon by PVRs, DVRs, or the name I think we're going to give to all of these devices, the name of the company that co-invented this technology that is going to win the battle and I believe lose the war and not be around to celebrate at the big party, TiVo. Although I think they're the one victory they will get, which will not be worth anything to them financially, is in another five, ten years already, sort of, we're going to call all PVRs TiVos, whether they were TiVo devices or not, the way we call all facial tissues Kleenexes and all adhesive bandages Band-Aids. The one satisfaction TiVo will have. But for those of you, how many of you have PVRs, DVRs, or TiVos? For those who do, you know the only reason for which you have them is to record programming. Also, if you're not familiar, the satisfaction, the problem I always think, thought TiVo faced was TiVo was very difficult to explain in 30 seconds. You want to know how great a TiVo is, you have to give me about 15 minutes and I can make you a believer. But it's hard to sell in 30 seconds. But it's the highest satisfaction of almost any consumer electronics device ever invented people's satisfactions with TiVos. So the internet, just one more little thing interfering with television advertising. Talk for a couple of minutes, because this is extraordinarily important to me, to the future of media. Not just television, but the future of all media. I'm a mass comm guy, and I've discovered and I believe that media never disappear. They adapt. They change. After television came along and sucked all the content out of radio, radio adapted. It became part of the music industry and promoted music. And you had disc jockeys. Radio changed. I don't think any of our media will disappear. I think they will all survive. But they may survive as smaller businesses in a digital era. This is not unprecedented. Already, the movie business, I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, the theatrical movie business is already a shell of its former self, having nothing to do with the internet. The movie business in 1946, in North America, 4.3 billion movie tickets were sold. Last year in North America, the population had more than doubled. To keep pace with 1946, you would have had to sell about 9 billion movie tickets. Instead, last year, 1.4 billion movie tickets were sold. Went from 4.6 with half the population 60 years ago to 1.4. 1946, 90 million people a week went to the movies. Last year, population doubled, 23 million people a week went to the movies. The movie business is a shell of what it used to be. The explanation, of course, was television. Now the internet a little bit as well, <coughs> but this has been true for a very long time. It survived as a smaller business. And of course the theatrical movie business drives home video, drives DVDs. But without you, the theatrical movie business would practically disappear. Over 60% of the audience is 12 to 24. You are still of the age of people who will go to movies. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, Movies require intense motivation. Movies, if you want to go to the movies, first thing most of us have to do is we have to find somebody to go with. How many of you have been to at least two movies in the last year by yourself? And uh, I'm not trying to embarrass you. No, movies are a great thing to do when you're by, sometimes when I'm traveling and in a city I don't know, I will go to the movies. But most of us, don't want to go to the movies by ourselves and if we can't find somebody to go with what do we do we just stay home and watch television instead 
movies you have to find somebody to go with most of us then that starts a whole negotiating process well I've seen this and I don't want to see this and I won't go to this and sometimes the whole process can break down over the negotiation you just give up sometimes you come to the, and then you gotta figure out how do I get there Is my car working do I take a bus will somebody give me a ride do I pick you up do you pick me up these things are easier if you're living with somebody and then you got all of that takes a tremendous amount of motivation compared to television which is always saying to you so quietly stay home relax <laughs> take it easy you don't have to find anybody you don't have to go anywhere at home you know the kitchens over there and the bathrooms over there and it's safe and this has been the real appeal of television it's it's really geared to all this laziness I don't mean all this lack of motivation film requires an immense amount of motivation and you who are more social than any other age group and still meeting people you are the ones who go to movies you will not go to movies very much when you turn 24 25 you will probably go from 10 to 20 movies a year or more to two to four movies a year the music business will survive but as a much smaller business the business model of the movie of music business has been nothing short historically of extortion the business model of the music business says you like those two songs on an album you have to spend fifteen dollars on a CD today through digital downloading interest in music is skyrocketing people are more interested in music than they've ever been because now you can listen to music everywhere on airplanes running doing anything you want to do so our interest in music is climbing but we're not spending fifteen dollars on a cd when we want two songs we're either taking it for free downloading or as the music industry would say stealing or we're spending the two dollars by doing legal downloading and the music business doesn't like this it wants to be as big as it ever was and it's not going to be because if you take 15 years ago a really successful CD a, a the most successful CD of the year would sell 15 to 20 million copies an immensely successful like Michael Jackson's Thriller or Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill would sell 25 to 30 million but the business model if you take fifteen dollars at twenty million copies that's three hundred million dollars today that same album I don't mean literally that album but something that strikes the nerve the same way may sell not twenty million copies but thirty five million copies but not at fifteen dollars each at two dollars each so all of a sudden and this is at the top of the market the three hundred million dollar album becomes a seventy million dollar album the business the music business is going to do just fine but it's not going to be as big as it used to be the most successful CD of 2005 was Mariah Carey's The Emancipation of Mimi which sold three to me 4.9 million copies that was the number this is how it's shrinking the most successful CD last year any guesses you're not the prime audience and you are the prime audience for most CDs any guesses on the most successful CD of 2006 Disney's High School Musical and the more pathetic 3.7 million copies that's what it took in 2006 to have the biggest CD of the year 3.7 million and this year it's gonna I don't know what it'll be but it'll be less because the music business is down about 20 percent this year If you download one song from the album, is it considered it's a an great album sale? question? My numbers, of course, the 3.9 were the numbers of CDs sold. Now, how many people bought Disney's High School Musical on? Uh, and High School Musical might be. We ask yourself, of all the CDs you ever bought, how many times would you have bought the entire album? The answer is sometimes, and I don't. I don't know those numbers. Uh, but I, in my, the Emancipation of Mimi, 
probably if you were to buy that you were going to buy it with three songs not with 12 to 15 songs so maybe well, along with those 4.9 million for Mariah Carey you can add three songs and another three million for, I don't know the numbers yet but the CD business is disappearing it real and you've already seen that with record stores are now getting very hard to find they're just closing left and right sadly I think the newspaper business maybe a much in a magazine business maybe a much smaller business online and traditionally seventy percent of a major metropolitan newspaper including the Des Moines Register has been advertising there will never be a day that seventy percent of a newspaper's website will be advertising that just doesn't make sense on the web You've all heard, and last year I think I talked about the challenges of newspapers. Circulation is down dramatically across the country, with the exception of USA Today. Uh, they've lost their, <coughs> their, real, their real cash cow, classified advertising to the web, especially places like Craigslist. You know that. Uh, since last year, there's a new threat to newspapers I'll just talk about briefly. Uh, in a world that, I'm not going to get into the politics of this, but polls show that increasingly Americans believe global warming is a real threat. And uh, I think we're going to start to see lists of industries and people who are the leading wasters of carbon. And I think at the top, near, at the top or near the top of that list is going to be newspapers. You think about the New York Times, they print 175 million pieces of paper a day except on Sunday when they print a half a billion pieces of paper and then they have thousands of trucks with gasoline and the pollute that deliver those newspapers I think newspapers are going to be under intense pressure uh, to go online or to shift some of that online of course the major audience the older people are still not online that creates a predicament but the challenges for newspapers are phenomenal. But I do want to make a point, and this is probably after the lady from the newspaper has left, so she doesn't even get to hear the good news. Um, I think the opportunities for newspapers dramatically outweigh the challenges. I think they face the greatest opportunity they've ever faced. And let me just make this point very briefly. For the first time in 87 years, newspapers are back in the breaking news business. No one's gone to a newspaper since 1920, in the beginning of radio, to find out who won the election or who won the World Series. We've known that as soon as it happened or shortly afterwards with radio and then television. If you went right now at seven, almost 7 o'clock at night, if you went to the website of the Des Moines Register or the New York Times and you saw a box that said, you want the latest breaking news of the world? Check back in 12 hours, people would laugh. If newspapers continue to do what they've always done, land on your doorstep in the morning, and then you didn't get any more news for 24 more hours, they would disappear. But now they are back in the breaking news business. A lot of journalists don't like this. A lot of print journalists used to like walking out of the New York Times building at 6, 7 o'clock at night. And no matter what happened in the world, they didn't have to pay too much attention until about 10 o'clock the next morning. Those days are over. We work with companies in this area. We wanted to see how up to date does a website for news have to be. With sports scores and stock prices, we found the window is 30 seconds. If I'm driving home listening to a game, park my car in the garage, walk into the kitchen, check my mail, and then go to the computer, I don't want to know the score 15 minutes ago. I want to know what happened in the two minutes since I parked my car. With news, that window is five minutes. People don't expect a complete news story in five minutes. They expect what they get from television, a headline, and then the details fleshed in as they become available. But the, go ahead. Hang on to that just for a second. No, it's, 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 I, I encourage you to ask questions, so I, I welcome that. Let me just finish the thought then. And it, uh, so the net effect of all this being up to the minute is really remarkable. 
because just as the New Yorker cartoon in the 90s that some of you may have seen said that on the internet no one knows you're a dog, on the internet no one knows you're a newspaper. Because there's no difference on the web between CNN and the New York Times, or two of the entities I've worked with, there's no difference between Sports Illustrated and ESPN on the web. As hard as, and we're moving into magazines a little bit too, as hard, I'll just move to the magazine for a moment, as hard as Sports Illustrated tried, it could never compete with ESPN. ESPN was live, it had audio, and it had video, which is sort of important where sports is concerned. The New York Times could never compete as a medium with CNN for those same reasons. But on the web, there's no difference between the New York Times and CNN. To call the New York Times a newspaper is only to refer to where it originated from. To call Sports Illustrated a magazine is only to refer to what it used to be. On the web, Sports Illustrated has audio, video, it's live, it has an incredible archive, much better than ESPN's, that people can search and find out history, just as the New York Times archive being around five times longer than CNN is much better. On the internet, you're no longer a newspaper or a magazine. And the people who are really threatened by the internet, ultimately, is television in this sense. It's the television programs which now face competition from their print brethren that they never faced before. And uh, I think this opportunity far outweighs every challenge. RSS feeds extraordinarily important, but most users don't even know what RSS, really simple syndication, stands for, and most don't really understand, except they understand they're pulling in information from places. And I'll talk, I'll finish this, and I'll finish this fairly quickly, with the fact that uh, young users of information don't particularly care where their information comes from as long as they get it. So hang on to that for a minute. Just to finish this, um, but having talked about the other media, print, uh, film, music which will exist but I think will be smaller on the web, I think television is going to grow in significance even with this increased challenge from newspapers and television is going to be bigger in our lives than it's ever been. And let me just, first thing we see is we think a surprising amount of internet and entertainment and video is going to move to mobile. and. Uh, Almost everybody's focusing on these little screens we carry in our pocket and asking, are we going to watch two-minute clips? Are we going to watch trailers, sports packages? People are forgetting that we're also buying bigger and better screens at home than we've ever had before. The gap between the home television and the movie theater is closer than it is, or narrower than it has ever been. I've been one of the few people, and I haven't been proved right or wrong yet, I've been one of the few people who feels we're not just going to watch two, three minute clips on our handhelds. We're going to watch 30, 40, 50 minute, hour long things. I think we are five years at most from simply acquiring video programming on a server, which is a fancy way of saying a TiVo, a uh, hard drive, or some other dedicated server. And I think 70% of that programming, you're going to clearly in your mind know is going to go in one, and you're going to know exactly where it's going to end up. The, pro, the movie you've never seen before, you're going to watch on the best screen you have at home. Your favorite television show, the finale of American Idol, if you like American Idol, that you're going to watch on the best screen you have. But the movie you've seen three times before, the programming you're marginal on, that stuff, I think, moves to mobile. The other 30% falls between the cracks. If you're homesick, you'll watch more of it at home. If you're traveling, you'll watch more of it on your mobile. But we think a tremendous amount of video is going to move to mobile. And uh, the small screen is going to become, I should have put this up a minute ago, even more important. I'll just develop this theme a little more. We think television moves to downtime. It escapes from the home. By downtime, we mean time that is otherwise not productive. Now, most of us have learned how to move voice to downtime. 
To use a stereotype 15 years ago, many of us grew up, graduated college, and left home, moved away. And, but we used to call our mothers on Sunday mornings because long distance was cheaper on Sunday mornings. Then we acquired cell phones that had different pricing plans. It didn't matter in Ames whether you were calling Des Moines or Los Angeles. And uh, Sunday was no different than any other day of the week, although some people had nights and minutes, weekends and minutes. Um, so we figured all of a sudden, wait a minute. I'm going to call mom on Sunday morning on my mobile phone. Then we figured out, wait another minute. I don't have to call mom on Sunday morning. I can call morning. I can call morning. I can call 